Larry, good to get you back. You're in hey. lockdown in Panama, and I'm in the other side of the Caribbean, but we're both yeah. surviving. Uh, two former Manhattan pals, and now we're different parts of the world, but that's that's the new COVID world. That I'll take right. it right now. So I just want to catch up with you because you've been kind of changing some changing some of your thoughts, adding to your thoughts. So I'd love to get an idea of how you're thinking about this because these markets have got everybody scratching their heads. You either are a momentum trader and believe in total belief in central banks or you're kind of stuck on the sidelines right now. So talk me through what you're thinking about. Well, I think something very powerful is happening around um, kind of equity valuations and what's called the dividend discount model and say terminal value model. Um, so in other words, tech stocks, for the last five years, we've had a really hardcore, very, very certain, hardcore certain deflation environment. And if you think of um, companies like Netflix or all, all the cloud stocks, uh, there's a huge group of stocks that are really priced off of what's called terminal value. And that's your, say, Netflix is doing right now 25 billion a year of revenues. That's up from 20 billion a year ago and up from 16 billion a couple of years ago. But what what the terminal value models do across Wall Street is they take the, the current 25 billion and they incorporate that over 10 years. And so if you have certain deflation, certain deflation, that cash flow is worth a lot more. But uh, because of the Cobra effect, we, we wrote uh, a blog on our website, thebeartrapsupport.com, about the Cobra effect. You and I can get into that. But because of the Cobra effect, which is the un essentially unintended consequences, the certainty of deflation has gone from, you know, like literally 100 percent certainty over the next five years to maybe 50 percent certainty. And that, I think, is starting to shake the core of tech, uh, some tech stocks. And I think it, it could be really... Uh, substantial drawdowns for these tech companies because of this kind of valuation problem. So, I mean, it sounds like they're trading like those super long bonds, those hundred year bonds where- Exactly. You know, if think about Netflix, it's 10 year cash flows. Right now they're doing 25 billion and you take 25% growth. That's just a huge long stream of cash flows. Microsoft, same thing. So what I think the, the fascinating thing about this is you can make the case in a certain, certain, hardcore, certain deflation environment that these stocks are worth 30 to 50, maybe even 60 times earnings. But if you go from you know, hardcore certainty to un uncertain deflation, uh, the, the market's probably gonna revalue these companies down at, at say 20 to 25 times earnings. Back in 2011, Microsoft traded, I think it's you know, six, 15 times. You can see it when you look through, and I've been focusing on this, is when you look through and split the market down by those that have debt, and particularly high debts, or involved in debts, banks or triple B rated equities, none of those are going up. But when you look at anything with a lot of free cash flow, no debt, I mean, it's a whole different world. There's like, there's infinite appetite for this stuff. Yes, and so, so right now, um, and you and I have been talking about this on Twitter, and, and you've mentioned it a bunch of times, right now, the the momentum stocks and say big tech and these cash flows are trading at a four standard deviation premium, four standard deviations, which is absolutely incredible, premium to the value companies. And um, what, what happens is, is if we go from a certain deflation environment and we bring in all this fiscal policy, you know, think about the last 10 years, we had austerity in the United States, we had the Tea Party, and now we're coming to a world of really populists where Democrats and Republicans on both sides are forcing uh, more fiscal at people. You know, this, this, this universal basic income, all these new changes around the world. And, and so you've gone from a world where equities were, were valued with 100 percent monetary policy. And as I talk about in my book, you know, after the failure of Lehman Brothers, everything was valued by monetary policy. Now we're going into monetary, monetary and fiscal world. And so I think you're gonna see a colossal rotation uh, from these, these really high cash flow companies that are based off of future terminal value over toward the value space and toward um, metals mining companies, value companies. So do you think that fiscal 
is necessarily inflationary because I'm not sure. But I mean, that's what the market is starting to think is fiscal stimulus is inflationary. Monetary stimulus was not in the end. Sure, it devalued currencies, but it didn't generate inflation as measured by CPI or whatever. Well, fiscal with COVID. So just take just take um, just take copper, for example. Right now, copper. So all the analysts on the street were looking at demand, demand, demand. And all the research reports for the last like three, four months have been focused on this demand crunch. What no, nobody really looked at is the supply. So when you have fiscal policy that's pumping up demand for uh, some assets, but then all of a sudden you have COVID where you take 30% of the mines in South Africa or 30% of the mines in, in Central America and also South America are offline because of COVID, then you have a real supply problem. And But the biggest thing is that if you think about this, last year, the year before, see the last three years, if you look at the amount of bonds on the planet Earth that were below one and a half to one and three quarters, it was like 60 to 70 trillion. Now that number is 110 trillion. So there's an extra 50 trillion of bonds that are below, say, one and three quarter percent. And what happens is when there's that much of the world's wealth in uh, in the same trade, People are, are, are just forced into uh, commodities. That's why you, even Warren Buffett, here's my, my, my main point. Warren Buffett, who has just been trashing gold for a long, long time and, you know, and moved into stocks like Apple, has now taken almost a almost billion dollars and bought a gold miner. And, and, and I think that at the end of the day, we're seeing a transformation here where um, even the Warren Buffetts of the world, if, if he's moving into gold mining companies as a hedge, then, then these momentum stocks are in trouble. Now, could he, could Buffett instead be trying to buy cheap discounted cash flows? Because the gold miners have a lot of cash. They're throwing off cash versus the software companies that are highly valued for that cash. Maybe it's not a gold play. Maybe it's a free cash flow play. Yeah, it definitely is a great value. <laughs> it's a great, but at the end of the day, that free cash flow is going to be determined by, um, you know, high gold prices. And in, in other words, you really need, I mean, if gold, if gold prices, if gold drops from 2000 down to a thousand uh, barracks and that cash flow is in big trouble. So he's making a, he's making essentially a colossal bet on, I think either stagflation or, you know, he's moving his portfolio out of financial. So he was moving out of financial assets and into more hard asset cash flows. And so that tells you that, you know, it's one of the smartest investors in the world. You have to think, if he makes a shift like that, at the same time, you have these tech companies, these momentum stocks that are really priced for a 2008 to 2020 world, you know, an austerity rich world with monetary policy, then uh, I think that there's a real big shift coming. Again, you know, part of your core thesis is the inflation side. I understand that there's a supply constraint but where does demand come from? Because if I look at all of the consumer growth across almost every country, regardless of where they are in lockdown or not lockdown, they're all kind of down between five and 10% year on year. Surely we need to see growth come back to positive before you ignite those fireworks. Because if not, it's still difficult to see demand offset the restriction in supply. Yes, and that's why, you know, if you look back 60s, 70s, especially in the 60s, you never go straight to inflation. But what happens is you have these dislocation periods like we're going through now where certain supplies of certain commodities, I mean, you've got just had, just look at the ags, for example, mosaic. Uh, you're talking about a stock up 50%, 60% this quarter in the agricultural commodity space. So, and you're talking about floods and you're talking about COVID, you're talking about farming and the ability to get products to certain places, supply chains, you talk, ESG, for example, supply chains, you're not talking about moving, you know, you never know with these populists in, in Washington, right? They could force the Intels and the Apples of the world to move 30% uh, of the supply chain home. So you have a, a deflation environment that was driven by, uh, by China, all of a sudden, even with weaker demand, as you're pointing out, we go into, but if you change the supply chain and, and then you take the ESG rules, just look at the HP bulletin today. 
you know, they're, they're basically getting rid of their thermal, thermal coal production. This is one of the largest mining companies in the world. They're, they're getting out of thermal because that's, you know, bad, that's not ESG positive. That's, you know, your environmental standards of, of governance. And they're, and they're actually raising the standards on, on their met coal. Um, so your, your met coal is your, your coal that's, that's needed for steel production. So all of these things, there's so many of these, like, and so we talk about the, the, the Cobra effect. What is the Cobra effect? You know, in, in late 1800s in, in, um, in India, you had a Cobra problem. Uh, and the British, the British uh, government controlled India, and you had a co Cobra problem. So they started to pay uh, people for each cobra, cobra that was turned in, you know, try to save lives. And sure enough, it worked for you know four or five months. That they they had a, a number of cobras that they had contained and were killing them. And lo and behold, uh, all of a sudden, there were a number of these these gentlemen in the, in the countrysides of, of India that started to farm cobras, obviously, <laughs> and selling the cobras back to the government. And sure enough, the government to stop it, they stopped the policy of paying a pat one pound per cobra. They stopped the policy. And what did the cobra farmers do? They released the cobras out into the, into the cities and the towns. So then you had three times more cobras. <laughs> you had. So the point is, when you, when you take the hand, the inefficient hand of central planners uh, and, and government officials into this mix, all these government officials around the world have the most power they've had in years. They're embracing this power through COVID, and they're embracing this power through new fiscal policy. And when you throw that into the mix, you just have this cocktail that, that is very unlike the previous decade. Parts of this reminds me of 1999, um, where we had this kind of, it was the basing of the industrials complex, but the tech stocks exploded on a similar thing, because it was a very deflationary environment after 1998. And then it all ground to a halt. What I'm kind of interested in is, okay, we're starting to identify if there is inflation, it makes those tech stocks, the high flyers, particularly vulnerable. Um, and that's the you know positive real interest rates discussion that many people have had, which many people suggest might hit gold as well. But we'll talk about that in a bit. But the other thing that I think is interesting is you and I talked about, I think last time we talked about, is we've got this election in the middle. And if the Democrats win, they're going after these companies, I think. It feels that the regulatory environment for the big tech companies is going to get a lot harder, potentially. So depending who wins the election, there's going to be fiscal stimulus either way, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden. And there's going to be a lot of it. And potentially, if it's the Democrats, they're going to come after these high flyers, whether it's raising taxes or regulation or both, probably. Um, and if it's Trump, well, because of Trump's very kind of pro-market forces in the way he likes to run the economy, he likes to run it hot. Well, the probability yeah. of inflation rises. So it feels that we could be getting to an inflection point that the market doesn't think about. Yes. Yeah, so, so Kamala Harris, you know, is from California. And that was an interesting choice for Biden because it was more left wing. He could have gone more centrist with Susan Rice. And so he's gone more left. I've had this thesis that you just laid out. I, it's, it's been, we've written a number of bear trap reports about this thesis because we work with our team in Washington. ACG Analytics have been very helpful. And we've, we've sat down with congressmen, senators, and we try to look at the committees and, okay, how, what is the House Financial Services Committee or what is the Senate Finance Com Service Committee going to look, like look like next year? And the Senate has been blocking everything, right? So you've got the House Financial Service Committee that's in control of the Democrats, the Senate Finance Committee is controlled by Republicans. So if the Senate's take the Senate Democrats take the Senate and they take the White House. It you know, it literally shifts you into a full throttle uh, change in the fiscal. There's no like offsetting uh, formula. So you you would get you know a much bigger fiscal response that wouldn't have any blockades. The the one thing I'm worried about with Camilla for my thesis of being bearish tech is she. You know, this is a real test because Trump has really reached out to the middle of America, gained some of the populist votes, some maybe some of those Bernie votes went to Trump, whatever they gained some of the, maybe got some of those independents. So uh, if Camilla is from California, her relationships are very strong with the tech companies. And as the you know, former you know, top 
uh, top legal official in, in, in California. Uh, I, I hope that she's not in the hip pocket of these companies, you know, because the Silicon Valley is obviously out there. But other than that, if they're smart, the Democrats, they want to take a, a shift toward the center of populism for sustainability. And then they, the, the deficit's just so, so, so large, there's no way that you don't go after the tech companies. So, I mean, that's a, another interesting thing is, if we look at the, I mean, we can't figure this out until we get close to the election or past the election is the types of fiscal. So let's think about that for a minute, because I think that's going to give us some opportunities as well. If I look at the Democrats, the chances are there's ESG, green investment. So that's going to change the dynamics of the market potentially. Um, I guess the oil companies look a little bit like that could be the case. If it's Trump, maybe the oil companies get some market share back. How are you thinking that the two different fiscal stimuluses play out? Well, what's amazing is by the time you get to the election, the trade's probably 50, 60, 70 percent over. So the, right now, the um, ethanol companies were, have been flying the last couple of weeks because you're looking at potentially with the Biden administration, uh, even though Biden's been coming down in the polls, right? So either Trump or Biden, the market's pricing in. Well, that's why it's not of, that clear, right? So that's yeah. why it's quite interesting. But a lot of these green trades have been moving, like a lot of, um, you know, Tesla, <laughs> right? So, so these Nat, Nat gas as well. Nat gas, my God, yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I want to. I think right now, a lot of the Biden portfolio, and if you talk to, you know, we at the Bear Trap Support, we have our um, Biden portfolio, and, and we track that on Bloomberg. And then you track your Trump portfolio. The, the Biden portfolio has been outperforming the market by about 800 basis points. So it's it's priced in a lot. So if you you're getting to the point, it's, you know, at some point it might it might make sense to go the other way toward a Trump portfolio, uh, where because the risk reward is just better. Uh, because at some point the, the the trades on the on the Biden side get so priced in that. You know, the election comes and they actually sell off. So what, what kind of companies are in the Biden portfolio? What kind of companies are in the Trump portfolio? Well, in the Trump portfolio is much more um, infrastructure, steel dynamics, uh, you know, large companies that are Vulcan industries, companies that are part of that. Is Trump, remember, Trump, I don't want to say he was, he wasn't treated very well by the Republicans when he came into office because uh, you had Mitch. And Paul Ryan essentially pushed the health care in front of, of Trump, uh, so in, Trump, in front of infrastructure. Trump, Trump's, Trump wanted to do infrastructure first, and they literally forced him through Senate rules and some tricks of the trade. They forced health care into the agenda. So Trump's going to come out hard on infrastructure. I mean, incredibly, this is, I, every meeting that we're having around the Hill points to a real shift there. So that's where you get into metals and, you know, your copper, your... BHP Bulletins, you know, they're, they're down at, for CapEx is $7 billion now, uh, down from $22 billion in 2014. CapEx! So th th these companies, uh, in terms of like BHP and some of these metals companies that feed into the infrastructure, they are not positioned for, for a big infrastructure uh, like renaissance. So the, those are you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck right there. I mean, that that's where we're focused is your. And that sounds more inflationary than the other side, I would imagine, because you're buying a lot of raw materials. ESG, less raw materials, more other stuff, but big infrastructure sounds inflationary. Yes, and it's it's you just have too many. You have probably 15, 20 million jobs that aren't going to come back for you know your airline stewardesses your waiters and waitresses, it's at least 10, there's a lot of jobs that aren't coming back. Now, a lot of those people can't get into infrastructure, but there's a certain portion that can. Now, the problem with infrastructure is you, you create a plan and then to get it into the economy, it takes a, a little while. But what's, what's crazy about the market is the market will price this in way before the money actually comes in. And, and then you look at Wall Street. I mean, the one thing that gets me worried about like like the whole dividend discount modeling thing, right, today. So we're at 22 times on the S&P. And what's fascinating, Goldman this week raised their price target from 3,000 on the S&P to 3,600. And that's really an aha-like capitulation moment, right? And when they came out with that, 
they they stress this whole dividend discount model. And this isn't like the term, the terminal model, terminal value is another one that we talked about. That's another model. This is just pure Fed model. They're just looking at the yield on the 10 year, free, the, the free, the risk free rate on the S&P, earnings power versus versus where the 10 year is. Right. So the risk free rate versus uh, risk free rate, 10 year versus the S&P earnings power. And that model, the, the, the crazy thing about that is. Right now, you're 22 times earnings, and the, the, the thesis is you can go to 26, 27, 28 times. But, but the smell test doesn't work for me on that, because if that yeah. were the case, Japanese stocks and European stocks would be the most expensive in the world. With negative interest rates, the div- dividend discount model means that equities are infinitely priced. But that's not the case elsewhere in the world. So why should it be in the US? I don't get it. And, and that's the craziest thing. But you just nailed it. The craziest thing is the 10-year Treasury, which was a risk-free rate, in March and April was 55 bips. And now last week it was at 55 bips. So you could have used the same reasoning. It's just a greater fool's here. You could have used the same reasoning in March and April to get into the, to, to value the dividend discount, discount. So they're just trying to justify the price that's gone up. Yes, and it reminds me of um, when I was at Lehman, I wrote, a, you know, about my book's now done a great job. It's in 12 languages. It's a colossal failure of common sense. I was a trader at Lehman. I ran our distress business. And I'll never forget, we had our huge pile of distressed loans. It's a great story. And uh, we had $2 billion of distressed loans. We were doing all these deals, which we were getting hung. The bank was getting stuck with these deals. And uh, Alex Kirk and Mike Galban were our big uh, big managing directors ahead of fixed income. They were like, listen, we got to hedge this portfolio. So we went out to the West Coast. We started looking at these subprime candidates. And we came up with a really incredible thesis to be short subprime, get long CDS on some of these companies. And we came back, we pitched it. We were about to basically make a huge bet uh, to try to hedge all the loans in the loan book. And um, they, they said, oh, you're going to run this by our chief economist. So we took the entire presentation. It was like three managing directors, myself. We went up, made the presentation. presentation, And they, they tried to stop the trade because they said the United States real estate market has never gone down in a uniform basis with unemployment rate uh, as low as it is, right? So they're basically at a, an entire multi-year thesis based off of a certain condition. And I, I think it's the same thing now, like like this belief system. So everybody's believing in the, this dividend cash flow model that stocks can go from 22 to say 28 uh, times earnings because just because like a universal belief system, but there's nothing really behind it. And, and those yes. types of belief systems can collapse. Yeah, I mean, I agree because again, when everybody says, well, the Fed QE is goosing stocks. Well, it is by behavior because people have this belief. But again, if that were the case, UK stocks, Swiss stock, everything would be much harder than they are because they've been doing it for longer and more aggressively. But it doesn't seem to be the case. So, so it has to be a belief system. And that's what it was with housing. In housing, when you made a presentation to short subprime, they looked at you like you had three heads round. And like we like literally because of a belief system that it's never if the market is. So the, the, the beast in the market, the serpent in the market always will find its way around these types of belief systems. And that is, I think, that the, 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 what's going to crack the market and crack tech is just that if, if you go from the certainty of deflation, which is 100% certain six months ago, nine months ago, to just, just 50% certainty in a world of where stagflation risk is rising, then all of these companies that are trading at 60, 70 times earnings, maybe you should trade at 30 times. And then you're going to see maybe right now there's 7 trillion bucks in banks. I think a trillion to 2 trillion is going to move out of those bank stocks and into some of these sectors, these infrastructure names, these value names. Uh, that are more globally exposed to the weaker dollar. Because one of the other things that's been driving that value versus growth, Mike Green spoken a lot about in Real Vision, is the flow of funds from index funds, from basically millennials sticking money in their 401k and saying, I only yeah. want index funds. So it's kind of skewing everything because the baby boomers all own the value stocks and active portfolios, and they've been selling now for a long time as they're going to retirement. But the millennials are just buying the same basket. Each person is buying exactly the same stock. Now, so that creates kind of inflation in the main stocks. I'm starting to think, okay, we're about to get to this kind of fiscal stall in the US that I think you and I talked about last time we spoke. 
Um, who, who knows how it plays out? But the point being is a lot of people, as you rightly said, are not going back to jobs. So once that support leaves from the government, that buying of 401k by the marginal millennial sort of dries up a bit. And I worry that at the same time, you say there could be a change in the inflation narrative. There also could be a change in the fiscal narrative over the election. We also end up with marginal less buyers of index funds. So there is a potential for a perfect storm within this. Yeah, and, and it's just it's just the, the dog chasing the tail. You've got so many people in the same trades. And now we're the fiscal cliff. You, you saw today uh, Walmart reported earnings and they said, they literally, you know, they're they're they've got very, very sharp financial people that are that are running that company, and they they are literally monitoring it by the day, by the week, and they said, you know, as the fiscal juice was pumping in June and July, uh, you know, they could see the sales, but then they said something happened in July when you know when obviously the checks started coming off, uh, that's where it gets back into this kind of short-term deflation risk, but would be brought by a fiscal cliff. So you, you've got a fiscal cliff coming because. If they don't prime the pump, and right now in Washington, everybody went home for recess. Uh, now they want to bring people back to talk about the post office. But there's definitely a fiscal cliff here because Walmart told you today that, that there's been a change in spending. It sounds like there's a potential for the economy to slow because of what's going on, the fight um, over stimulus and stuff. So maybe things slow somewhat, you know, as, sh- as states partly close down or city, you know, there's restrictions on people and the ability to spend. But that kind of goes, I mean, if I'm thinking through to, let's say, February or March next year, right, the year-on-year comparisons are going to be the largest in all recorded history. So the numbers are going to look ridiculous. Everything's going to look ridiculous, including the rate of change of the markets. So you're going to get this huge growth pattern that's going to look like you've suddenly got you know, 10%, 20% GDP growth. And you'll have had the stimulus starting from the new government, whichever government it is. That sounds like that that's a very dangerous point. I'm trying to think the phasing here because, you know, obviously to try and short the tech stocks is like playing Russian roulette right now. But it feels like if it's going to come, it comes in the new year. I don't know. What do you think? It's going to come when we have a moment where uh, you remember in February 2018, the average hourly earnings came out on that Friday and then we dropped like 12% really quick the next week. So there was the, basically something, anything that takes, like say you have like this, you have a, a vaccine-a-thon. So you've got $100 billion, $200 billion gone into vaccines. You've got probably, and I've watched, I watch Real Vision all the time and I've seen the different guests. There, there might be 70 different probabilities in vaccines. And so if those 70 probabilities turn into say 10 by the fourth quarter, all of a sudden, uh, you know, your vaccines are bringing people back to back to a reality, back to baseball games in the, by next year and uh, back to the NBA finals uh, next year. So and back to the Masters and all these sports and NFL. And so then you're, you're talking about a big reversal. At the same time, you've got all this fiscal policy that's oozing around out there. So that that gets you a big problem. And then you look at the Fed. So the Fed, uh, I talked about this in my book, uh, Colossal Failure Common Sense about Lehman. The Fed um, went into a period where they were really handicapped around central banks, and we didn't have any fiscal policy. Now, um, they're, they're really, because of the inequality and populism that's risen, this massively rising inequality, you know, riots in the streets, you've got more and more people on social media. I mean, just look at the, your, some of your tweets that are around the Fed and, and, and some of the tweets that are had something to do with inequality get tons and tons of viewership. So the Fed knows, and there's been, in the last two Fed meetings, by the way, there have been two or three questions about this. So you're talking about a social justice Fed, and the, and the Lael Brainerd speech uh, about a month ago was a game changer. So you're talking about a Fed that is embracing the Larry Summers mantra, don't hike until you see the whites of inflation's eyes. A real social justice Fed, it's like they really believe that if in 2000, say 13, 14, 15, if they hadn't brought, if they had kept the QE going on longer, they would have been created inflation, right? They really literally believe that. And so th- this time around, 
You've got politicians spending more than ever because of MMT and modern monetary theory and the belief that they can't create inflation. At the same time, central bankers uh, are, are really cr creating a, a social justice, like a political element to the Fed. And Ben Malkman, you, your interview with Ben Malkman was fantastic. Ben's talked about this. You're talking about like a Fed that's going back to World War II, right, where it's politically driven. And so all this is changing next year. And so what you're talking about is this shift in the data with the vaccines. It's all setting up. So I think the, the blow off top is sometime here in the, in the third, fourth quarter, and then a big move down in the first quarter of next year. We're talking like, I think the tech stocks, I think it could be 50%. And that's kind of not what the market's thinking at all, right? Because the market thinks the risk is all now. And everyone's like, why don't the stocks go down? But actually, the recovery is what risks the stock market, not the recession. Yeah, the market, the market's going to look 12 months out. And it's, it's, if you're coming in, and remember, if we get back in 2018, the reason I brought up that average hourly earnings is this, you know, a lot of people on the street were talking about, that's what, when the average hourly earnings picked up, that's what the street went from looking at, you know, three, four rate hikes to their starting price in eight to 12 rate hikes in 2018. And by the fourth quarter of 2018, the beast in the market stopped the Fed cold. But every bank on the street, and you were you were pounding the table that the Fed would stop. And you were absolutely right. But the, the street was calling for, remember, the fourth quarter of 2018, they were still calling for eight more rate hikes. And it was, a lot of it had to do with that hot data. And so, so now um, you're, you're talking about a situation where uh, the data could get hot again. And, but the Fed is like, has a vested interest because of inequality not to respond. How do you think the bond market plays out in all of this? I think, you know, I, I, you've made a, first of all, I commend you, the bond, the, the bond market call that you made last year in the first, second quarter was phenomenal. And you guys have been right. And um, I just think that you could, that you might get this one, you know, dance with negative yields, but the convexity is just so poor in terms of the amount of bonds that are below one and a half, one and three quarters, that any dance down there below one, below, below say 50 bips on the tens, any dance down there is very short lived. And I just think like a year and a half, two years from now, uh, you're going to have a situation where they're kind of losing control of the long end. Why would that be the case if it's not been the case in Europe, the UK, Switzerland, you name it, right? So they, their bonds have danced at negative 50. Nobody really cares. The banks didn't like it, obviously, but but nobody really cared and didn't really make that much of a difference. Well, why do you think, think why do you think Japan do that? Yeah, Japan's the same thing. So let's look at Japan real quick and then Europe. So Japan, they did like a trillion and a half of deficit spending over say six years. So if you ooze in the deficit spending over six to ten years, the the, the bond market can handle that. Um, in Europe, remember we had. You know, austerity, austerity, austerity. We had black, black zero. I mean, you know, black zero. There was literally in the German finance ministry, uh, there on there's a mural on the wall of black. Their dedication to black zero because of the depression and, and, and hyperinflation. So black zero is basically like, you know, massive amount of fiscal controls. And so all of that's been thrown out the window the last six months. At the same time, the U.S. If you just look at the U.S. versus Japan, we're doing three to four trillion of stimulus in a six to nine month period versus Japan's like one and a half trillion over say a decade almost. So I think the difference is, is that you've had a big shift in Germany from black zero to really fiscaling up and, and spending. At the same time, the US has done just an insane amount of, of, you know, it all comes down to this. The Lehman hole was identifiable. I talked about this in my book. You had, a, you had literally six banks, you had to fill a hole. Now you have a million holes to fill, a million bank, like so. Your capital hole is gone from one, six banks to say five million holes, little little holes, small businesses. And so the only way to fix that is to do a massive, uh, uh, you know, shotgun of uh, uh, four trillion. Because monetary doesn't work in insolvencies, and we're talking about yeah. large insolvency events. So monetary stimulus doesn't really work. It doesn't help you get your job back or help with you know servicing your debts really. So fiscal is the only answer. I get that. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see two things. Is One, if the economy looks as good as it does now, how they can justify fiscal. I think it's going to be justified on environmental, if it's the 
the left, it'll be environmental and inequality. On the right, it'll be make America great again, rebuild the infrastructure, I guess. If there is, so let's get into a slightly apocalyptical situation. I'm no inflationist, but I'm super interested in this because I, I see the validity of what you're saying is, is if they do stimulate and the numbers look suddenly hot and you've got coronavirus under control from a vaccine, how the hell are they going to issue the bonds? Yeah, that's that's the Ben Malkman uh, thesis. And Ben's, you know, Ben's numbers are startling because once you get into that realm where they have the balance sheet is now seven trillion by next year, you're talking about maybe 10 to 15 if they keep on this social path. And there's just so much of that portfolio that will be repriced. And remember, 65 percent of entitlements now, I mean, 65 percent of of 65% of the interest on the national debt is entitlements and interest now. That was before COVID, before COVID, before. So you're talking about, <clears throat> you're gonna go from 62% of interest on the debt to, to being entitlements and interest to maybe 82 over the next like couple of years. But, but that's why they have to keep rates down. But the, the debt's just so big now that it's just gonna, the, the the entitlements are going to eat up more and more of this of the, of, of the but spending. then don't we get into the old trap just thinking this forward the knock-on effects so let's say this happens right we ignite this inflation fear 10-year bonds go to two percent the economy goes off a cliff again because there's too much debt but we're in this weird dynamic where it's almost self-regulating because you you can't generate inflation enough because as bond yields go up the economy tanks because there's so much debt. So it's a, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah, that, that's where you could get the real deflation, is when, when the beast in the market forces central banks and politicians into austerity. And that would be caused by a 10-year going to, say, 3 4%. And just, if you just do the math, the, 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 the numbers are so vast now that because You've got the interest on the debt being at 62% entitlements and interest. If you go to 82, the whole thing changes. So the real deflation scare is, is I think, like a year and a half, two years away. And whereas near term, the the, the, the risk is, is stagflation. And what will the Fed do in terms of yield curve control? Because they might just say, well, fuck it. We're just going to pin rates to at half a percent at 10 years and be done with it. I mean, is that not what they're going to try and do to say, look, we want to see the whites of inflation's eyes. We want to sit around for a while. We don't want a few months CPI print. We want core inflation to get to 2% and stay there. Yeah, that, see, that, that, that white yield curve, Buffett told you by taking $7 billion of his portfolio out of financials. Now, he still owns Bank of America, but he reduced the financials by about $6 billion, and he added a gold miner, let's call it a billion. So that's a financial repression. That's a yield repression. That's a yield curve control move, right? So, like in other words, if if Buffett's telling you that he believes your yield curve control will work in the short term, because if he be, if he believed the curve was going to steepen because of economic growth and that the, the Fed would let it steepen, he would stay long the banks, right? Because the banks are going to crush it in a steepening yield curve. Or he so, believes in the other theory that I've got, which is in the insolvency theory. You buy a cheaply discounted gold mining company that hedges a lot of its gold exposure, but has high quality cash flows, high quality management, much cheaper than buying Tesla, which doesn't generate cash, but let's say better than buying Oracle or some other company. Um, and then on, on the flip side, he just got rid of anything with massive debts in. I mean, clearly he got rid of his airline stake. You know, yeah. it sounds like he's setting up for lower economic growth for longer or some sort of shift that you're suggesting. Fascinating to see how that plays out. Yeah, and, and on, on Twitter, you see all these people saying, people have to understand, it's not people like, oh, we only invested $600 million in, in, a, in a gold miner, and he's got, you know, 20, 20 to $30 billion in Apple, maybe it's more. You know, so in other words, the amount of money he's got in Apple relative to the gold miner, I get that. But this has nothing to do with it. You're talking about a guy that has speech after speech for 60 years, trashing gold, and you're talking about a person that knows an awful lot about, you know, the yield curve, a lot, a lot about a lot of, about banks. And so to, to move from financial assets and take, reduce those financial assets by 
six billion and then take I mean, almost a billion of that. It's, yeah, it's I mean, definitely a signal. Regardless of the gold thing, Buffett is one of the world's best bank investors. Yes. Right? He's basically the lender of last resort or the bailout of last resort for many banks. Always has been, you know, from Salomon Brothers onwards. So he's been involved in this. And for him in the middle of when the markets are rallying to offload large stakes of his banks is instructive in some way. He's not really told us why he's done it yet. But I, I find that very interesting because he would normally be a buyer at this stage and not a seller. For him to be a seller is interesting. Yeah, because there's such value in the banks. I mean, the banks are cheap. Uh, they're trading it one times book versus, you know, they, they can well, trade. He obviously thinks book is not worth book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he's telling you. Yeah. And and J.P. Morgan, I mean, that that, that was his prized possession. And it's interesting to go from J.P. Morgan, though, and then increase his Bank of America. Another thing they might be doing is Buffett always said, put your eggs in one basket and watch the basket. Maybe he just feels that he's too diversified in the financials and would rather just have one horse instead of three. Yeah. So what else are you looking at right now? What else is on your radar screen? I mean, uh, no, I'm going to ask you, sorry, I'm going to go back a question. So when do you want to short these tech stocks? Oh, brave boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm short right now. And I, I think the way, one, one strategy I love is you do a put spread on the Qs. So the Qs are at 280, around 280, you, uh, you, you buy the say, the, say the 260, 200 put spread. And guess what? If you're wrong for two, three months, you buy, then what that means is you just buy the 260 put on the Qs, which is the NASDAQ ultra, NASDAQ 100 is 50, 60% tech, right? It's 50, 60% big tech. So that's what you want to short. And so you, you buy the 260 put out to next March or even June, and you sell the 200, and guess what? If you're wrong, you've sold ball. And let's say we're wrong and the, the VIX collapses over the next two months and the market rips. Then you buy back your lower strike and you reduce the cost of the trade by a lot. And you're not going to lose a lot of money if you're wrong. Yeah. You don't lose a lot of money. And guess what? And that, that, that trade, I talked to a, a, a portfolio manager of ours. We have a Bloomberg chat with a whole bunch of different PMs. He's up, you know, he's up, he's up close to $200 million dollars in tech stocks. And I'm just saying, you know, I said, take 35 million of that and put on this put spread, you know, because you're just protecting your earnings. And you're, and you're, by the way, if that, if that trade pays off, if we have a, another fourth quarter drawdown, like we had in 2018 or a drawdown in the first quarter next year, your, your, your payoffs like three, three and a half, sometimes four to one, if you, if you, if you have the right ratio. So you're, you're, so you're, say you have a three, $300 million dollar uh, profit in something, you take 30 to 50 million bucks, you put it into this trade, and your, your potential and, return is 100,000. And I had a discussion with people in gold just before the correction. I'm like, listen, it's getting pretty frothy. You know, I'm sort of a long term gold bull, but you know, these things can go up and down. Why not just, even if you don't want to be as bearish as you and hedge it with puts, just own calls instead of stock? Yeah. One of Who's the best. That? You know, because then you're locking in your profits. All you can lose is the premium in your calls, and you still participate on the upside, and you can look like a hero. The one thing when I when I met when I went to Omaha, I met with Charlie Munger, and we were talking about these different strategies. Charlie Munger gave me like one hour together, but right before the Berkshire meeting, we were talking about because I don't understand why more people don't. Okay, say you have a a profit in a stock. Most people sell their winners far too early. Buffett's famous for holding those winners, and and he said if you have to do one thing, sell your stock that you're up, let's just say you've doubled your money, and then take 25, 30% of the profits and buy like a long-term call spread, right? So you let's just say you've made X amount of dollars uh, and you take 20 to 30% of that and buy that long-term call spread and just be there for the big one. And, and that, that, that's, that's, a, 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 that's probably one of the best strategies throughout a lifetime of investing that, that I've ever heard. Yeah, that's right. And people don't do it enough. I mean, I don't do it enough. And I, I should think about it. You know, particularly, you know, vols are cheap now. So it doesn't cost you a lot to have a you know, stock replacement strategy, buy calls, and then you can sleep at night. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's the, the, that's the thing. So we're looking at across the portfolio. We're long the ags. We, we have an overweight position in the agricultural commodities. If you look at the commodity space throughout all the different cycles, it's typically the metals that take the first move out of the gate. And now we've got the flooding in China. Uh, we've got this 
Three Gorges Dam, which that's a whole other, you guys have done a great job at Real Vision on that. But this is, a, you're talking about 30% of China's potential agricultural infrastructure that's at risk. So you have COVID that, plus obviously this inflation risk or this deflation risk. So the, 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 the countries, companies like NTR and the Mosaic, I think that your risk reward is you know, 30, 40 percent downside, but your upside is sit by, I think, five, six. Well, I'm going to give a caveat. So I'm going to give you a story. Back in 2006, I started building a long ags thesis because they were really bombed out. By 2007, I decided to pull the trigger. And with a friend of mine, we started an agriculture hedge fund, which was basically always had to be net long, but we could short things against it, et cetera, because people wanted to be in the trade but have some sort of hedged exposure. Yes. And so we built the macro thesis and the framework and everything else. And I'd gone around the world speaking to a lot of really interesting people about it, people like Nick Roditi and stuff like that. And so we, we started this thing and raised a few hundred million dollars. And and firstly, you realize how unmacro the space is. It trades really macro for a while. Yeah. And then something happens in the corn in bloody Iowa, you know, because there was a rainfall overnight. And you're like, OK, I can't predict this stuff. It becomes really hard. You have to be a yeah. true expert to understand the weather patterns, what's going on. And when you're trading, you know, sh sugar crops in Brazil versus sugar crops in India. And, you know, it becomes almost impossible. And the macro gets filtered out very quickly. You know, so whether it's a weak, it was a weak dollar environment at the time, uh, the weak dollar environment meant they were going up. Then completely bizarre to us, we, we thought going into 2008, you know, I could see there's potential recession coming and all the bad things. I thought ag should be fine. No, they got destroyed because lending to farmers disappeared. That's right. Yeah, so like, farmers went bankrupt. I'm like, oh, I give up. It was the hardest trade I've ever I done. I remember as the Fed was doing their first version of MMT in 2008, 9, 10, 11, uh, the ags did rip again. So Yeah, <laughs> but, but they're, you know, they're just hard. And remember, you had China. Uh, fiscaling up as well so you had both things over but yeah. so great to see you guys and uh, you know it's uh, you know i always love coming on and and as i tell my wife once a month as a former lehman trader if we sell a million books we'll break even on our lehman stock <laughs> go, go out and buy a philosophy or common sense <laughs> so right let's wait and see how this plays out i think it's an interesting thesis i think it makes a lot of sense um you know it makes me very nervous for next year for a number of reasons. I've not really been involved in the equity market this time. I've been short a few banks and, and the, um, General Electric and, and uh, AT&T, but, but only in small. But, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting because I, I think the market's now not prepared for anything to go wrong. And what could go wrong is a number of things, whether it's a change of government and change of regulation, whether it's an inflationary pulse or an elongated recession where the general buyers of index funds disappear for a while. So I think you're right. I think if people are involved in the trade, switch to calls or buy some put spreads. And uh, if you feel like a punt, it looks like there's an opportunity on the downside coming. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of gains out there to protect. So Exactly. Protect Larry, great to get you back. Good to hear your thoughts. And as ever, I'll catch up with you soon. God bless my friend. I'll see you at the top. Yeah, absolutely. Wherever that is. <laughs> okay. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.